right, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us in person. Thanks online folks for joining. Um, I apologize, I'm kind of uh, recording this in a weird way, but you know, we'll capture it. Slides are available and we'll make sure we send those out. Um, but very happy to have Ali who flew all the way from Silicon Valley here uh, to visit us and give a talk about the deep programming language. Um, and I have to tell a small story about Ali, how we met um, long ago when I was a graduate student. I was attending C++ conference uh, and I was volunteering and um, for to do the time for Ali's talk here, giving the keynote. Uh, and then towards the end of the talk, uh, Ali was giving away many books like he's generously done. He said, I've got one more copy. I'm going to give this deep programming language to my timer friend here. Uh, and if you actually watch the video, you can see him do this. Uh, and then I held onto that copy. It's still in my office at uh, Northeastern and signed. And that's how I got involved with D and kept learning the language. So thank you for uh, oh, the book thank and thank you for coming full circle here. Wonderful. <laughs> and, yeah, and also, uh, Mike was a speaker of our uh, DCOM at DCOM this year. And as a surprise, at the end of his talk, he put that video. <laughs> and I was like, what? You were that person? So that was a wonderful yeah. circle closing here. And he said, would you like to come talk? Of course, I would love to talk. <laughs> so you never know, right? Keep like me. All right, so with that said, I'll okay. let you take it away uh, for the deep programming language introduction. So welcome. All right, on. thank you, everyone. Again, hi, everyone online. All right, let's start. So I will try to introduce D to you all. Um, at the end of this talk, you will be exposed to some basic syntax of D. I will go through some history, design decisions, and principles of how this language came to be. And some software engineering paradigms why it will fly by. And just to make it interesting, I'll show you how D adds modules to C. Accidentally, basically, <laughs> almost. And I'll give you just a couple of small examples of Fibonacci series as a range. And as an afterthought, I added this XML element generation with compile time magic. It's not really the representative of D, but there is this interesting feature we have. Uh, you will see it. Before that, I'm really curious about you. Can you please read this list and let me know which one uh, fits you the best? I will ask soon just to read the list. OK, who used D professionally? I did. Steve is here, our community member. I knew <laughs> you almost. About who used D personally? More than Hello World. OK, three people here. I don't know, of course, online. Have you ever written Hello World in D at least? Yay. <laughs> no, you're professional. You're at A. No. <laughs> Has anyone heard about D before, but never tried it before this announcement? Oh, that's that's a lot actually. OK, because usually it's like D. Is there a language like that? Interesting. <laughs> Lots of people. Who heard about D for the first time from this presentation's announcement? Yay! That, so we achieved one person at least. Is there anybody who's not sure what D is? No, that's good. OK, let me introduce myself now after learning a little bit about you. I come from a C and C++ background. Uh, you can say heavy C and C++ background. Um, in 2009, it was already uh, 20 years in the industry for me um, coming from there. And in 2009, C++ 11 was not there yet. Yes, you can tell. I was a member of the ACCU, which uh, prints used to print at least paper magazines. And in one of those magazines, I read The Case for D by Andrei Alexandrescu. He's a known C++ person. He wrote the um, modern C++ design book. When I read The Case for D, and he was basically selling, introducing the D, I, I was like, yes, yes, this is so great, great. I was sold immediately. This doesn't happen to everyone. Some people have their doubts because they are coming from other languages, but I was sold immediately. And the same day, I translated that article to Turkish as Neden De, which means YD, created a website, as you see there, that dedili.org, and started writing an HTML D tutorial for the Turkish audience to teach computer programming in D. And D was younger back then, still being developed. 
Over the years, I translated that story into English and self-published it as the Programming in D-Book in 2015. And all of the blue lines in my presentation are links, of course. You can click and get, there, get to the site where the book is freely available online. I've always been members of communities, reading from the bottom. I've been a co-organizer of the Silicon Valley C++ meetups. We used to call them ACCU meetings back then, but now the term meetup is more common. I am the co-organizer or sometimes the organizer of the Silicon Valley dealing meetups. I may consider myself as a Boston meetup organizer too, because we have some <laughs> friends here. Just because I'm here, we <clears throat> came together. And I ended up being a founding member of the D Language Foundation over the years. Um, but still, I consider myself a mere mortal because I didn't create a programming language. I did not write a compiler. I didn't, I don't contribute to the standard library or the runtime of this language. I'm, I'm just someone who knows the language, who happened to wrote a book. But here we have uh, Steve, Steven Schweighoffer with us. He is the person who is a little more than a mere mortal, so he contributes to D runtime and D standard library. If you have further questions, he would be able to answer the questions much better than me. <laughs> That's true. And he is one of the biggest editors of my book, too. I'm very happy to see him. Professional D. I used and still use D at work. I work at Mercedes-Benz Research and Development North America. And in an autonomous driving project, I wrote a family of tools to deal with ROS bag files. People know ROS here, I assume. ROS is robot operating system. Any robot, any autonomous driving car can take advantage of this system. And the files can be really big. And the tools we wrote in D were very useful, used by hundreds of developers daily in their daily works. I also worked at Weka. This is, uh, according to some metrics, this is the fastest file system in the world, according to some test metrics. And that fastness, that uh, performance is sitting directly on D. They are completely based on D. It's their CTO, Liran Zribel, this is an Israeli company. He used to be keynote speakers at DConf. And he would say they did similar things in the past with C and C++ but they couldn't have done what they did with Weka without D. So that's one uh, main company to showcase. There are many other companies that use D. One of them I single out, Symmetry Investments in London. This company seems to be the corporation behind D these days, and they sponsor our conferences like they did this year in August in London. They pay for the space, we go there, and they scoop up all the best D people in the forums and they all work for them, most of them. There are many others on many different topics uh, D is used. And uh, this is for my honesty. Why am I here? I'm selling D. And as I said, not to make any, uh, not to have any gain myself, but because I think D is an excellent programming language. And I say it knowing excellent doesn't mean perfect. It is a it, has, it is a 20 year old language with its words and historical baggage and all that stuff around it, but still it's an excellent programming language. All the adjectives here, very powerful, compiles fast, executes fast, simple, safe, practical. All of these are the things you feel when you write in this language. And then over the years, we also see there are some emerging, emergent properties. Not everybody designed it to be exactly moldable. This is something we hear from many people. When the requirements change and you want to change the program, it should be easy to change. There are some languages where you resist and you say, ah, can we not change it, but maybe get by doing it in another way? Here, requirements come, and I found myself at Mercedes-Benz Research and Development almost waiting for my friends to come to me with new requirements because it's fun to go. And the yeah, the fewer boilerplate. The amount of code you don't write is staggering. You just write a few lines of code and it just works. And it's fun. And this is something to stress. We're all human beings. We're not part of a robotic system where we look at uh, feature lists of two programming languages and, oh, this one wins because it, two more, it has two more 
more bullet points. I want to have fun while writing my programs at work. And these are emergent properties. That's why we're still sticking with D. Before coming here, as I said, I'm selling D, but there are some advices behind my mind. Uh, you should watch Dan Sachs's uh, CPPCon uh, talk where he repeats, if you're arguing, you're losing. So I can't sell you D by arguing against Rust or against C++. If I argue, I'm lost already. Um, you have to be in the right frame to like something, to move something. Like I was in the right frame when I read Andre's article back then, I jumped right in. I can't convince you, I can't push you there. And another friend says, do not criticize other languages, just show the strengths. But on the next slide, you will see D is against some odds. When I show the strengths, all the other languages have all those strengths too. Unless I compare, unless I tell you what you're losing when you're with a certain language, it's very hard to sell. But I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to criticize languages. And the last one comes from a hardware engineer, someone who I respect a lot. He thinks programming languages are like screwdrivers or a pen. You can write anything with any language. Even though it's almost correct, I don't agree with it because sticking with the tool uh, metaphor, you can hurt your hand. You can cut your hand if the tool is uncomfortable. You want a tool that gives you ability to write correct programs easily. Okay, here's the odds against D. Many languages put themselves in a camp. They latch on to some idea and sell themselves of that language. Or they happen to have a killer app. People always ask, what's the killer app of D for D? There's no killer app. Okay, what's the corporation behind it? Is that a Google's language, Apple's language? No, we don't have a major corporation. Is that an object-oriented programming language, functional programming language? None, it's all of them. Is, it, is that for prototyping pro products? This is one of the big things. It's both your prototype language and product language because you move to product on the same language. This one is a, the no, no favorite kind of programmer is a jab at Go language here actually because they sell their language as it's for inexperienced programmers who are just out of college. They can't handle C++ so they should be able to write Go. I don't see anything like that in D. We're not for smart people, academic people like Haskell. In order to understand the monad, you almost need to understand the category theory. I still don't understand and I'm being honest. So it's for everyone. It's like, and Mike and I talked today, um, random people would write emails to Walter Bright, the creator of the language, and he would respond them back. Re Unlike some other programming language creators where they wrote, they didn't receive any email. There are a few anecdotes like that. So it's a welcoming like a kind of community and person. What's the problem domain? Where is it this for? All or memory management. For example, C++ demands that deterministic memory management is required. When you're done with an object, you're not only running its destructor now, but also give the memory back now. That's their main focus. D is not like that. Deterministic, you can do it. Garbage collection is accepted, and it's it's the default, by the way. Or you can do manual. And some languages are latch on to bad mouthing something and not take, taking it away from you. Like mutation is bad in functional programming languages. D doesn't do that. You can mutate your variables even inside your pure functions. I'm not going to go into that. Um, or uh, here's an anecdote. This really happened between Sean Parent and I. I went him in an excited way after a talk. Have you looked at D? I was about to say what you're showing on the screen could be easier in D. And he said a language with reference types. No, thanks. Now I use his name because I'm also giving a link to his language where he's selling his language as devoid of references. So many languages have this strong idea of something that they latch on to, to sell themselves, to differentiate themselves from. This is something against D because it doesn't have some anything like that. And the last one is about C++. 
which I have experienced myself. If you become an expert in C++, you get a badge of honor or a badge of bragging rights. You know all those esoteric corner features of that language. And this also happened. I asked a young uh, Google intern, they were giving a talk, I asked why C++, there are lots of emergent modern languages out there. And he laughed and said, because it's hard. And I agree with him. I was there and we're humans, you know, achieving the difficult thing is a badge of honor, bragging rights, it, it puts you above. Okay, having all the odds against D, now this is a general definition of D. Once we go through this list, I will also show many code examples showing some of these. It comes with a very familiar syntax. Many people coming from other languages find it very familiar. It's, it doesn't come with esoteric syntax. It's a system language. It is, it is maybe was uh, the king of compile time. Very powerful templates, very powerful compile time introspection, strongly statically typed. It has type and attribute inference. Multi-paradigm, as some of you were talking, every language goes multi-paradigm these days. Both very low level, as low as C, and very high level, as sky is the limit, of course. Compiles and executes fast. Readily links with C and C++. It comes with a C uh, background. The whole D language sits on C as a starting point. So if you have a C library already, C++ library already written, you can link with D readily. It's ABI compatible. It allows multiple resource management options. And the second one is more like the philosophy of the language. The easiest thing you should do should take you to correctness. You shouldn't, you should make mistakes if you really tried hard. So easy path should lead to correctness. This uh, is a direct quote from uh, beer conf this weekend from uh, Walter, the creator. The program should be intentionally correct, not accidentally as well. And this is about the dot nand initial value. <clears throat> some of us don't agree. So there was a, some discussion about this on the forums. And we don't have an ISO committee sitting behind the language. This is designed by community through D improvement proposals. But Walter Bright is the benevolent dictator. I kind of scratch it here. He's actually the biggest contributor because there has been many examples where the community pressed him down saying, we don't agree with that idea. So he is not really the last word. The community has a say. Okay, so some of the examples, templates, the compile time templates are very, strong in this language, and we think the template syntax is very lightweight in D. Every function, uh, or a function template in this case, has a function runtime parameters, those are the function parameters. Before those parameters, we have the compile time parameters. In this case, min returns the minimum of two values of two different types, perhaps it can be int and double, int and long. Um, so L and R, capital R, just some types in this syntax. User-defined type templates have also the parenthesized compile time parentheses. So in this case, capital T happens to be any type. And dimensions of your point apparently is two by default. But as you see at the bottom, you can instantiate it with your own um, values and types. This question comes a lot, that's why I put it here, the exclamation mark point, the um, binary version of this use. People are used to reading it as not, the logical not operator. If in the binary case, it's the template instantiation syntax. So if you do two bang int, it means the int instantiation of the two function. And it means convert my string to int. It could be too long, to double, depending on the situation. Um, we have template constraints. When you write a function template, you can put some constraints on it. For example, if I have two full uh, functions, I can say the first one works if the type of, uh, the size of the type you give me is at least four bytes. Or the other one maybe is the type you gave me is a string. Maybe I have different, more optimal implementations of this function. 
copy is a little complicated there because it says I can copy from input to output as long as the input is an input range and output out is an output range that takes the element type of input range. This is usually the case, but you can put these constraints on your function templates to steer your code to go to the most optimal, more correct one. We have variadic templates. Um, args dot 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 means any type, any symbol, any uh, value at compile time. Now I'm stepping a little to the side on this slide and also showcasing static for each, a compile time looping construct and also static if a compile time introspection construct. What this does is uh, if you look at the use uh, on in the middle where I pass four arguments, when I use it with this call at compile time, the for each loop will execute through, go through all the uh, arguments and only the ones that happen to be int in this example will be selected to be injected into the code. So there will be no looping at compile time. At the end, there will you will get only two lines in this function, right line one and right line two. This static for each allows us to build switch statements at compile time. You put a switch, static for each inside, and you inject case clauses of your switch depending on some introspective time. You can do it for all values of your enum type, or maybe there's some selection. Only three of them should have case clauses and everybody should go to default. Static for each also allows that. We have type inference. In the first box, you see I don't mention any int, double or s, who is that is presumably a struct s. Just because function returns s, my immutable s variable will be an s, int and double. They are all inferred. Uh, the language has arrays and associative arrays. And on the first array line, it's an int array. The next one is an, a map, hash table, basically, dictionary. Keys are string and values are int. So that's the type of it. We have lambdas in this language, but I show the language infers f and d in the bottom uh, box as function and delegate. Functions are uh, similar to C function pointers. They are just simple functions, but delegates actually carry their context, their execution context with them. They allow closures. If I returned that d, it would be a closure because the, the, the language infers it's touching a local variable i, so its type is inferred to be a delegate in this case. But I'm showing this type inference. Of course, everything happens at compile time, and this is a strongly statically typed language. We have attribute inference. Um, if I have an add function template with a and b, and if I instantiated it with an int and a long value, the compiler will infer not only the return value to be long, but also these attributes on it. And these attributes mean, you can read it of course, pure means it is guaranteed to produce the same result for the same inputs, because it doesn't touch any state outside of the function. There's no module scope, global scope. And the compiler sees this code does not throw. It does not allocate from the D runtime, which we call the GC heap. And this code is safe it will not corrupt memory. If your A and B were not int and L, if the, one of them was a user defined type and your plus operator addition operator was overloaded, the compiler would see other things, might see other things and say, oh, that plus operator actually might throw an exception and you wouldn't get the no throw. So these are all inferred at compile time, which you can specify explicitly as well. I said it's a multi-paradigm language, and I just give some examples. The first one is the imperative style. If some condition, do this and that, and there's a for each loop over some names array, string array, apparently. We have object orientation, oriented programming, multiple interface, a single class interest inheritance, just like in Java, unlike in C++. Multiple interface, single class inheritance allowed. Generic, we've already seen examples of this, and generative. You can generate code at compile time, building up some string, for example, and you can mix it in. 
in your uh, this mix and code would mix that code in right here and we call this generative programming further we allow functional programming i'm copying something adapting something from wikipedia plus three is a function an anonymous function which we call lambda which says given int i i produce i plus three the second was one is a little complicated that's why i colored the second lambda interestingly the second one says given f any function I will produce a new function for you, which will be apply f of f of x to a given int. So this is a higher order function example. So we support functional programming. And then you can make your g variable saying apply twice plus three, please. And we, when you call g with one, you get seven because plus three is applied twice. Three is added twice, basically. OK. It's not a functional programming language, but it allows you all this. That's the right kind of impression. That's what you have should have when you see this. So apply twice is a lambda. It says, give me a function. I will return a function that will apply the function you gave me twice to an int. It's pretty complicated stuff. And functional programming languages have a ton of this. It's in their uh, minds all the time. But this is uh, a little difficult. <clears throat> OK, the, the bottom one is very much D-like, actually. D's strongest point, very idiomatic code, is the one at the bottom. We call this component programming. This one should be easy to understand. File foo.txt opens that file. Byline is an algorithm that knows how to uh, visit a content line by line. And then the next one filters with the not empty condition. So as the byline is traveling your file line by line, the empty ones will be filtered out and filter will give you the not empty ones. Further map, just like in a functional programming language, capitalize your lines. And further take will take only 42 of those. So the beauty of this one is it's lazy. Nothing happens in this construct itself until you start pulling elements out. You will be contacting take the bottom one saying, give me an element, please. Now get rid of it. Give me the next one and take will tell you I'm done because I gave you 42. But take would be relying on its source, which was would be relying on its source. This is very idiomatic indeed. Um, and the beauty is these are like Lego pieces. You can change their orders. You can put your own ranges in between your range algorithms, and we love this. I will show you more examples. Yes, please. Silly question, but uh, so does it start from the bottom saying first, or it starts from the bottom or the top? Does it go line by line and then apply them, or from the bottom and the middle? The question is, yeah, it goes from the, the top, right? top up, but if I will show you another slide which will make this clearer a little later on. <clears throat> It's it's top to bottom in this case, but it's actually inside out, as you will see a little later. And the final uh, multi paradigms. This is also something D is pushing for. We have design by introspection. And as I've so shown earlier, my range may be a range type that um, depends on a template parameter T. Let's say T is another uh, range. If T is infinite, I should be able to tell to the world that I am never empty. Maybe I will be using this infinite thing. And note that enum empty. Enum makes a manifest constant in D. It's not even a variable. It's not even a function call in this case. At compile time, I give you this falseness on emptiness. I will never be empty. So the code looking into this type will know it's never empty. Elf, though, is my type is not infinite. Oh, then I inject three member functions in my user defined type with the simple syntax. Else, the, my type can have a function that tells whether I'm empty at runtime. My the length, it can compute some length, or it can even provide op index, which provides random access with an index value. If it's not infinite, I can do this. So this is what we call design by introspection. Andre Alexandrescu has a set of talks on this topic where he shows 
his checked int class. An int where you check when it overflows what happens, how it's much more capable than um, solutions in other languages because this he uses design by introspection. I said it's a very low level language. We have assembly blocks, bit operations, pointers, you know, these are all the CPU level uh, things. You can do typecasting because it's a system programming language. An integer can be converted to a U-long pointer. Or we have unions to share bytes of different types. It's also a very high level language. I just picked two examples here. When you have an array of files, you can loop over them at runtime one by one and execute the body of the for each loop for each of them. Normally, it's iteratively one after the other. But if you put that parallel, it runs your body on in parallel on all your cores for all the elements of your files array. And this is a, an awesome feature. It puts parallelism into such an easy use case. And then another example here, D doesn't have some type or pattern matching in the language, but the language is so powerful that you can come close. And this is an example from some type. If T is a some type, you can say match. And this computes uh, the Fahrenheit, basically it gives you a value in Fahrenheit. If the contained type in your some type is already Fahrenheit, you get the degrees. Otherwise, if it matches these other ones, you do some other computation. But if you know there are three lambda functions that are matched, pattern matched almost, a poor man's pattern match basically. And I stress these two high level helpful constructs are not in the language. These are written by the language's features and any D programmer could have written them. These are from the standard library. We have a set of compilers three common ones. All of them use the same front end. DMD is the reference compiler. And the back ends are different. Again, DMD provides a back end. This one compiles extremely fast. We have LDC sitting on LLVM, just like many other language out there does these days. So we get all the optimization possibilities of LLVM infrastructure with LDC or GDC. This sits on top of the GCC's backend. And here, I'm very proud actually, because GCC has been this old compiler technology everywhere in the Linux ecosystem or Windows ecosystem for me. D happens to be at this one of the standard languages that comes with GCC these days, one of seven. So D is not esoteric, a corner language for me anymore. It comes with GCC. So I see GCC as a main, um, Every, I respect GCC for its history. There are many works in progress. Many people write their own compilers, and some of them are libraries. Compiler is a library. I don't know the state where these are, but we hear people working on their personal projects. The bottom two are interesting features for me. I never use them, but we have an RDMD compiler, which turns into your code into scriptable. It has the hash bank syntax. You can even evaluate D code on the command line. OK, when I said fast compilation, I asked on the forums recently and I got these anecdotes. DMD itself was sitting on a compiler backend written in C++. At some point, semi-automatically, it was converted to D. The C++ backend would compile in a little less than two minutes D immediately started compiling in eight seconds. So that's the compilation speed difference we're talking about, about 13 times. Somebody reports completely unrelated C++ and D project by normalized by lines of code is 15, 20 times faster. Somebody else compares quite big game engines. And again, they see 20 to 30 times faster with D. But in this case, they say, 20 to 30 seconds for C++, but one second for D. One second means zero. Because if I change my code and compile and see its effect in one second, my mind is still on that code. I'm there. 20 seconds is an infinity. Because if I hit compile, I go to my email, I go get a coffee. Okay, it's not like two minutes. 20 seconds is still short, but I lose my 
track on my mind at that moment. So I think this is a big, big win for D. Compilation speed is amazing. <coughs> Uh, one of our D community members also has this compiler benchmark site, uh, GitHub project. You can check that out too. At this point, I introduce the creator of the language because when I introduce him, I also introduce some philosophies behind uh, D. He does not have a computer science background. He worked as a mechanical engineer at Boeing, but Boeing gave him the safety mindset. He explains at Boeing, if there is a bracket, piece of bracket mechanical that you want to install, there is, there's no way you can install it wrong way. The screw holes will be offset a little. If you flipped it and tried to install it, it won't work. Only the right way will work. Or some control lines. One side of control line will be short holes so that you can't connect it to the wrong side. Or they would be treaded differently. So these tons of safe safety measures taken in the airplane plane industry. So it should be difficult to do something unsafe. On top of this, he gets interested in computers and devours Tiny Pascal in the Byte magazine. I'm lucky enough to have touched that magazine way back when myself, not that copy. And then he starts to write a, a game for himself, goes to a respected person and says, hey, the compilers we use are too slow. My game runs too slow. How can I write a fast compiler? And somebody tells him, who do you think you are that you can write a compiler? <laughs> so he accepts this challenge and becomes a compiler writer. He wrote a, a C compiler, writes an interesting game, Empire. A older folk know this game very well. Oh, you wrote that game because some people still email him saying, not, I don't know whether still, but he wrote them saying, you caused a divorce for me, or because of you, I flunked college. This was an addictive game back then, played on mainstreams, the school computer main, mainframes. He is that guy. Then he writes the very first native C++ compiler. Bjarne Strostrup's compiler was not actually a native compiler. It was a transpiler from C to C++ or sorry, his C++ to C, and then he would run a C compiler on the um, translated code. But Zortec was the first C++ compiler. And he also claims, Walter Bright, he is the person who made C++ popular because it for the first time became available to per for purchase. Otherwise, C++ was a la laboratory or academic institution language back then. Then he writes his own C, C++ decompilers. Even he writes Java and JavaScript. His JavaScript compiler is where he learned the idea of a garbage collector. And he saw, wow, wait a minute, this is a very useful tool. And he added in his uh, language. And he created D in 2001 as a personal project. And internet never forgets. You can find his first idea posted on a forum back then, thinking about doing that. Then he joins forces with Andrei Alexandrescu in 2007. Uh, there are other people around him, of course, at that time, but Andrei joins him. Andrei is a very prominent figure in C++ world. Uh, he also became our language architect between 2007 and 2019. He wrote a couple of books, or three books in this case, the deprogramming language. And this machine gun to a knife fight is a quote from his own talk. He takes D code to C++ conferences sometimes, and he says, I was going to show you this idea with C++ code, but it couldn't fit on a slide, so I'm using D. So he is our, um, he used to be the second man of the language. He's still active in the language, still uh, contributes to the standard library, at least, with his ideas, but he is not a main, um, uh, he's not in a main position at the moment. Okay, after introducing Walter's safety mindset, um, uh, D is sitting on this memory safety idea. Walter Bright wrote an article called Arrays RC's Biggest Mistake. Because in C, you may have a function that takes an array. It's the same exact thing as the pointer to the beginning of that array. So a single element pointer is an array in C. So if you ask me, C doesn't have arrays. If it has arrays, it's like a, 
um, in a weird case, if an, is an, uh, if an array in C is a member of a struct, it has value uh, semantics, it gets copied. But if it's on a function parameter list, it has reference semantics with this through this pointer to the first pointer to the first element. Walter Bright told me actually on a gear conf that this may be actually changing for C for all these years. And there's a proposal now to change C's arrays to fat pointers like in D. So this is, this hurt us, you, all of us a lot, this idea of C. Because all the buffer overruns, all the vulnerabilities in software are based on this innocuous convenience feature. So that's why Walter um, designs arrays differently. Also, there's a very interesting um, exchange at DCON 2017. Andre, Walter, and Scott Myers of C++ are on stage at a DCON. And Walter says, I believe memory safety will kill C. And Scott Myers says, wow, there's this interesting exchange. C will never die, of course, because it's everywhere. It may be true, but now in 2021, if you click these articles, Google and Microsoft report 70% of vulnerabilities in their products are related to memory problems, and they single out C and C++. <clears throat> Atlantic Council report right again singles out C and C++, and now there's a US Competes Act. The US government is now looking at this topic seriously, and there's a signed executive order for improving the nation's cybersecurity. So the tide may be changing finally towards safe programming languages from unsafe ones, and C and C++ are singled out. For that reason, and as we talk with Luis today, every single variable in D has a compile time no initial value. There's no garbage value. You can have garbage value if you want to. There's a syntax for it, but by default it's safe. And ints have zero, uh, floating points have none, and even characters have an invalid Unicode code unit. Characters are UTF-8 code units in D, and this FF happens to be an invalid one. You can change your init value by with the syntax, but still I, I stress this is not a constructor. You're changing the init value of this type. You can imagine the init value as being a bit pattern stamped on your every value variable when you create one of those variables. And also we have this safe function attribute, which we heard a little bit. The code that's marked as safe, maybe an entire module, cannot corrupt memory because D disallows potentially corrupting um, features, inline assembly, values and pointer conversions, unsafe pointer uses, this allowed. Please click its spec for other uses of it. This is a long list, actually. I just picked some. The language has associative arrays in the language, uh, at the core language. Uh, this is a dictionary hash table from string. Keys are string and the values are doubles in this case. You can use your own structs and classes as key types as well. D makes a difference between static arrays, fixed length arrays, and dynamic arrays. Um, as I mentioned in C, if you have it in your struct, it has value semantics. So D follows that idea with um, fixed length arrays. They are very efficient. There is nothing but N elements side by side in memory for static arrays. And they are bounce checked and compile time if it's available. If you have an array of three elements, Array five will be a compilation error. But if the five was a runtime value, it would be a runtime error later on. But now it's a compilation error. In contrast, dynamic arrays are fat pointers, as I said, and behind the scenes, they are like a length and a pointer to the first element. And they're bounce checked by default. Um, D does not use the plus operators to add elements to arrays or strings. The tilde, or um, this is the concatenation or appending operator. I just give some example there. This time, array 20 will be a runtime error if it's out of bounds. 
dynamic arrays can't know. They, they don't have their compile time size, of course. Now, dynamic arrays provide a slice interface. If you know C++ string view, it's the same concept. A slice looks into existing elements without ever copying them. I, uh, on the first line, I have an array with four elements, and the slice into it is looking at element one and two, the index one and two, which means the 20 and 30 values right now. The second boundary is exclusive, so three is not included in the syntax. And you can write an is palindrome function like this. If the length is less than two, yes, it's a palindrome. Otherwise, the first and last elements must be the same, and I recurse and call myself without the first and last elements. There's no copying here. I'm just changing two things. Pointer is advanced, length is reduced, uh, basically, and I put a disclaimer there. This is actually buggy code. Don't do this because strings are unicode um, strings. You can't just get the last element. It's just a code unit here. But to show the idea, I decided to keep this here. Slices. OK, C++ uses the iterator concept because pointers of C and C++ are iterators automatically. D does the same. Slices are ranges in D. So it sits on the range idea. It uses the range idea. Element access and generator functions are provided as ranges. And there's a hierarchy of ranges. I will go this very quickly. If you have a struct which has empty front and puff front, empty should have been named as is empty because it tells you whether you're done with your element access or not. Front gives you the front element. Puff front moves you to the next element. And there's a forward range concept which also asks for a, a member function that saves the state of iteration or random access asks for indexing operator. Um, C++ is Eric Niebler at CVBG 2015 introduces ranges to C++ with a reference to D. It's a very rare thing for C++ crowd to um, acknowledge D, but Eric Niebler does it, and he bases his code examples entirely on a D community member's work. In some sense, ranges come to C++ from D, but there's a long discussion about that on this forum link, if you're interested, because Eric Niebler shows up there, and there's a back and forth discussion about that topic. <clears throat> I just want to give you an example of Fibonacci series generator as a range. Fibonacci series can be represented by two variables, current zero and next one. In this case, my range is infinite. It's never empty. As I've shown earlier, empty is false for this type. Front is the current element and pop front means iterate, goes to the next state, go to the next state, please. I compute next, next and shift next to current and next, next to next. I'm ready for my next value like this. And this type that you could have written is ready to be plugged into the component programming aspect, the range algorithms of D. I'm using that variable fib with take right now. Even though Fibonacci series is infinite, and in parentheses it will be very wrong because int will overflow at some point, but it will continue generating overflowing wrong values for you. But still it's infinite. I'm taking just the 10 elements for it and using it in my for loop here. So this is an input range example. But don't do this. One of the standard library features is recurrence, which is in std range. You can design, define your concept just like this. You can define any recurrence relationship like this. This says, given an array of um, state elements, in this case, it will have only two because I start my state with zero and one. Given an array of two, if I ask you produce the number nth, Oh, and I say it's just a n minus one plus a n minus two, and will be that one. So you can define it, and it's just the Fibonacci series in this case. Yes, please. How are you able to use the, that take 
Or How am I able to use take? Yeah, because it's not explicitly defined. So, UFCS. Oh, yes, UFCS is coming up. Oh. So, I will show you. So, the question was how can you put dot take as if it's a member function without Fibonacci series having it? It's actually a free function. I will show you very soon. It's coming up. We love this idiomatic way of using functions. Um, okay. Okay, before getting to that, I have this slide right here. Omitted empty parentheses is very idiomatic in D as well. Let's say you have a function that computes some optimum page size for a required alignment something, and it has a default value of 32, which means you can call this function without any parameters. So optimum page size, open close parentheses, is a valid call. Any time you can call a function with default parameters or not, maybe it doesn't have even any, any parameters, you can also call it without any parameters. So this is actually related to the moldable part of D. You can either have a value at compile time called optimum page size, maybe it was a variable, constant variable, or you can have a function that produces that result. Or let's say you have a struct size, it has a length member function. You can call it with length open close parentheses or without. So this becomes a property of your struct. This allows getters and setters in this language as well. With that knowledge, now let's move to my friend's question. Uniform function call syntax in D. Even though it's the simplest, simplest of ideas, it gets a little difficult to describe. So the compiler looks at your line. If it's a compilation error, for example, as my friend saw, that was a compilation error when I did the dot take, it also considers, is there a freestanding regular function called take, which takes that object as the first argument? So if I have minutes function, the usual syntax is minutes 10, but you can also call it as 10 dot minutes. And with the omitted parentheses, it's 10 dot minutes, really. And we use this a lot. 10 minutes produces a duration for 10 minutes. We have this in the standard library. The beauty of this is if you design a car struct, you put the member functions that are directly related to the invariants of that car struct. Some member function like things only depend on your use case. For example, can, can travel distance question may not be re relevant to the car at the core level, but your application may be using it. So when you introduce a can travel function freestanding, you can also call it as if it's a member function. So this solves a problem. The UFCS, the simplest of idea, gives us this idiomatic D, which I explain here. And this goes to my friend's question here. You said, does that go bottom to top or top to bottom? Let's say you have this complicated expression. The execution orders inside out normally. You say, write on the standard output, the even ones of divided numbers of multiplied of values. Oh, it's inside out. So start with values, multiply by 10, divide by 3, take the even numbers, you know, filter out the odd ones, and write them on screen. So UFCS, the simplest rule I just mentioned, if you apply that, it gives you this syntax. Values, multiply 10, divide 3, evens, right line. Excellent readability, and also this removes arbitrary, uh, necessary, temporary variable creations. Instead of writing this one on other programming languages, you would introduce temporary variables. You would say three times to make it readable. We don't do that. So this syntax gives us this readable, left to right, natural readable order, or top to bottom. And as I said, our ranges also allows us shifting them around for readability. D uses the module system. We don't have the preprocessor. We don't include anything anymore. There's no declaration, definition, separation like in C or C++. Uh, but I have to give a um, disclaimer here. When I showed you D compiles 15 to 30 times faster, 
we did not use modules of C++. C++ have new, uh, new modules now, so I don't know how fast C++ compiles. It was traditional C++ co uh, compilation, uh, header file inclusion at that time. So here's a module. You can give your module a name, import other modules, and look, you can say say hi without having say hi defined up front. It's, it's in the module. And there are no global variables in D. Everything is a part of a module. You can think of the module as a singleton module thing, and the variables belong to that singleton. Okay, we're getting close to the end. It's almost an hour, but I'm trying to wrap up. D has a better C subset. The reason for this is D runtime contains arrays, associative arrays, the garbage collector in there. It's a relatively large runtime. If you're if you don't want that for any reason, you can compile your code with better C and you get C like lean binary as as lean and C, but you get all the other benefits of D without the garbage collector, without array uh, adding uh, elements to arrays dynamically that those are gone. But look, it's C with constructors, C with modules. You get bounds checking. All of these cool things come with better C. This is one of the things Walter has been pushing for, and he implemented this on his own as being the benevolent dictator. <laughs> Later on, he worked on another idea. Import C. D is not C, but as I said, maybe you sense it's sitting on some C background. It's sitting on some C++ and C compiler code already. So the D compiler already has a C compiler in it. Walter said, can we actually import C directly into D? So he implemented import C. You may have a C source called my C math, and you may have a square. Today, you can import that C file in D and call that square function from C. OK, so I attended one of his meetups, uh, online meetups a few months ago, and he asked, what is the most important thing in a compiler? What is the thing that compiler is producing? What is it doing? It turns out it's the symbol table. I didn't know. So what import C does is it parses your C code to create a symbol table and then turns it to the D side, to the module system and says, wait a minute, D also produces a symbol table and makes that symbol table a module. Ah, OK, so I'm going to get the C symbol table and make a module out of it. Good. Now C code is introduced as a module to D. Your D accesses uh, C as a module. And then he goes on these runs he describes, on his runs he talks, uh, thinks and then codes. And he says, wait a minute, can I then import C into C? Can I import D into C? Of course, because at the symbol table level, the module level, there's no difference. So you know C and C++ allows implementations to introduce uh, keywords to the language. So he introduces underscore underscore import keyword to his version of C, which allows him to import C into C and import D into C. He did this in less than 10 lines of code. He shows the loop in, in his talk, and he accidentally adds modules to C. If you use the D compiler with your C code, you can get rid of all your header files. But of course, if you do some macro magic in there, you need to take care of it first. Put your declarations, get rid of all of them, and do this. You have modules in C. One of the biggest things in D is compile time function execution. C++ brought const expert. And we D people are scratching our heads. Why do you need a keyword for const? expert for compile time execution because indeed any expression needed at compile time and can be executed at compile time is executed at compile time for example if i have this regular function it produces the squares array if i assign that expression to a static const table and static const means compile time build table it will compile that squares array executed at compile time and build up 
uh, squares array image for you to be put into your data segment in your binary. And you can static assert that table five is 25. Or maybe there's a function that computes the optimum buffer length for some X. If you use it as a template argument, templates are compile time features, so you have to execute that at compile time. It will go ahead and execute it at compile time. We have user defined attributes. You can come up with your own attribute. In this case, obfuscated is my struct, and you can put it at obfuscated on any place. As long as you introspect for that thing and then obfuscate for some serialization output. And this obfuscation is not very smart. <laughs> it's a Caesar. Uh, it means my pet's name there, password was. OK, now I'm getting into the, I will go very quickly through these. I'm getting into software engineering help of D. Unit testing is one of the biggest helpers of the programmers because it's the earliest point that you can catch your bugs. We have a unit test keyword. Whenever anybody writes a function, you put a unit test underneath and just test it. You say assert repeating ABC two times should give me ABC ABC. You can have n number of unit test blocks for your code. And you enable it when you compile with dash unit test. It's the simplest of ideas again, because it is behind the scenes is just a special function. The dash unit test compiles that function in and executes it automatically. That's all. This feature is unit test feature is comically underpowered. I use this term and Walter loved it. That description I'm including it here, but it's enlighteningly pragmatic. It's comically underpowered because we say D has unit test, but D doesn't have mocks, fakes, fixtures, nothing at all. And unit test feature doesn't even give you a special checker. Assert is already in the language. You're just using the language itself. There's no unit test features that's given to you. However, this was the biggest engineering teaching moment for me. I used to be a perfectionist. If you gave me the unit test feature to implement for D, design for D, it would take me two years and I would come up with everything. Look at every unit test feature, unit testing features out there. Put everything in there, a complete feature. No, all you do is fake a function like a unit test block. Now what you've given people is everybody uses this feature and everybody tests their code. The simple, simple as small step gives you at 95% of the functionality. The power is given to you with a single step. So if you are, I'm here as an older brother to my computer science friends, don't be a perfectionist. Engineering is very different from perfectionism. I suffered through it. I'm out now. Just do one thing that gives you the biggest thing. And I see this resonate in D. Maybe that's why I love D so much. Um, <laughs> the language gives you a source document, but let me step back one more time. With other languages, if you want to do <clears throat> unit testing, you have to find the unit testing framework. There's a dozen out there at least. You compare them, you pick something, you incorporate unit testing in your build process to write your unit test code in a different directory under the test directory to be compiled and executed. That's an overhead. It's a mental overhead. The difference here is write your code, Write your unit, unit test block. It's there and everybody uses it, enables it. A simple, small step. We have source documentation, very much like Doxygen. You describe your function and you get an HTML output of it by default. You can CSS it for documentation style. One thing to note, if you source document your unit test block, that unit test block becomes an example code in your source documentation. So your unit test code is, your documentation is not lying because it's tested. So your unit test is tested, executed, and it appears in your source documentation. What I did recently is I put three unit test blocks where I documented, showcasing three simple uses of the language, of the uh, feature, but then I had my other unit test blocks to test the dirty, they are dirty to look at, they are just testing, but the documentation ones, I made them clean. And these slides, as you watch, are 
prepared with these documentation builder, DDoC. We have contract programming. Contract programming sees every function as a contract between the caller and the function itself. If the caller obeys these preconditions, the input conditions, the function will obey this output condition. So my repeat function, for example, says S must not, must not be empty or count must be less than 42. Another beautiful thing here with D is you can generate these uh, formatted error messages. This error message is generated at runtime, but you can do the same thing at compile time. If you detect a problem with your compilation, your caller is calling you with something wrong, you produce a compile time error string so beautiful, shows you exactly what is wrong with your call case, and your user fixes it and does it. Other languages don't have this. For example, in C++, until a few years ago, you could only use a constant string saying invalid, in this case, count value. But what was the value? C++ couldn't do this, at least a few years ago. Maybe they have this uh, compile time string generation now, I don't know. Okay, and you can have object invariants in your structs. Here it says, if hours ever more than 23 or minutes is 59, I have a bug in my code, so it will be caught. We have code coverage. No need to mention this. Apparently, my unit test is missing one code block, and if you run, compile and run your program, it will tell you, oops, only 75% you covered your code. I, I just produced something on a code sharing site for D, my codes are 100% covered. I'm not missing a single block. It has profiling support. If you compile with dash profile, it gives you this output where your time is wasted. OK, I'm very close to the end. So the slide says 49 of 59, but I will click through them. Please bear with me. Yeah, we have plenty of time. Yeah. Plenty of time, but I don't want people to get hungry and sleep. It's 1 o'clock. <laughs> We have a very flourishing, very lively D community, very friendly. I will get back to my fun part. So you are you choose your language not only because of its feature list, but also where you feel at home. So I feel like I am like Walter Bright. I'm like Andre Alexandrescu or Steve here. These are my friends. We are a community and I mean, yeah, the, nobody is, um, mean to anybody in very rare, only except rare cases. It's a very nice community. We are on the blazing fast form interface <laughs> written in D by one of our, I mean, it's, everybody sees that when you go to a forum, you click and then the database is read back. He does some smartness in there. He caches lots of pages to give you a very quick interface. We are on uh, Discord, IRC. We have two annual conferences. DCONF 2022 was in London, and Mike was there, of course, he mentioned. And COVID gave us DCONF online. We put them off phase in the year now. Uh, DCONF online is a permanent fixture in our lives now. We will have it in December. Online is, of course, free. I hope you can have time to watch the <coughs> presentations. We have a beer conf thing monthly online meetups. Steve is one of the organizers and he appears all the time. And you need to watch for announcement of it because it's a um, online meeting link. We have open source contributors on GitHub. We have MSc students of um, Romanian University. We, this is alma mater of Andre. And we pay those students. Some of them became our foundations on payroll. He is working for our compiler. They finished their uh, master's thesis in D, and we have Symmetry Autumn of Code, just like Google Summer of Code, preference to university students to get paid to work on uh, D projects. Do it now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is the last slide I have before the conclusion slide. Please bear with me for a while. I will show you an interesting feature of D. Let's say I'm trying to produce these XML um, strings. 
And XML has two different main versions here. If there's no data in an XML element, it ends with a slash and closing angle bracket. But if there's a data, the closing thing is slash and the tag that it opened that element. So image is an HTML, standard HTML one. Hi is my own XML uh, element that I created for this example. So I want to produce this. And I can imagine creating these objects like this. You can think of any other way, but I said, could I uh, chain the attributes like this? Let's say I start with XML image and source puppy JPEG, alt school mascot. You know what puppy this is, of course, being huskies. <laughs> with 200, height 100. Can I do this? Um, or in some cases, maybe I will give this some data as a constructor argument and chain one of the att attributes, but later on, maybe I will get B and C attributes later and assign to them later on. So, like here, so B equals yo and C equals 2.5 will appear. Now in the white space on this slide, I will show you a struct that does all of this. Thanks to these of this badge magic. So I imagined a struct XML. And I said, can I create that string in two parts, begin and end? And the beautiful part is, if there's no data, the end string can always be slash and closing angle brackets, known at compile time, never to allocate any memory for that one. Statically known, and as you see, the init value of end equals to that one. Begin, I will build up begin soon. And to string is a special member function in D that produces the string representation of your objects. So my string representation with, will be begin tilde. That's a tilde. The um, precision is horrible with this screen, but <laughs> I'm concatenating begin and end together. So the first function that comes is the constructor that takes a tag. I said, OK, this begin equals. I'm formatting an opening angle bracket and the tag. And on the right hand side, I'm giving you an example. So image and the closing part comes automatically from in it, right? Nobody assigns anything to it. This is already a valid um, XML element at this point. When there's data, I will take my data smartly as a template uh, parameter because it can be string, it can be int, it can be anything. As long as my data has a string representation, now, in this case, end must be something I build up like this closing angle data and then something that contains the tag. But also look at this special syntax D provides. This will call another constructor, in which case it's this one. So I'm setting bag in one constructor and only in this constructor. And here's the mas magic of, of this batch. Of this batch is a magical function that turns your normal compilation errors. Like XML doesn't have a dot source or dot alt dot with members, right? Converts your compilation errors of member access and comes to this of this batch and the member name that you tried to access comes in as a string. So in this case, I named them as attrib. And all I do is append to begin space key equals value in double quotes, not very readable. But for example, at the end of that h dot c equals to 2.5, I will get this begin and this end, and it would be what I was looking for. So this uh, smartness of things appearing as string as a template argument also appears in operator overloading of D. You will see that and we use it for our um, benefit. OK, this is the last slide. In conclusion, <clears throat> D provides competitive advantage. I think this should be underlined. If you're a professional organization, if you're a company, you should give D a serious look because it gives you an advantage on software engineering from safety, correct programs. It gives you happy programmers because you're not fighting the language. You're using this language, having fun under motivation. You get correct programs pragmatically. I think I've given 
enough examples of this, but D is much more bigger than I can show you in this short amount of time. Now, I'm at 56 of 59 because I have a little joke here I always like to show. This one is a C programmer. <laughs> oh. it, it looks very sad to me. <laughs> oh. This one is a C++ programmer. It looks equally sad, but the, the jury is out on that extra stuff. Is that bandages from self-inflicted wounds? <laughs> <laughs> or some people see a beard? And maybe some people see it's throwing up, maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Ali. First time. Thank you. Uh, we just have a small gift for you. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, have to get Dali equipped with some uh, Northeastern gear. Yay! <laughs> I didn't tell you, but the person taking my photograph it happens to be my daughter, and she's a double husky. What do you call it? Yeah, yeah, I'm a double husky. <laughs> I came in for that. That's all I mean. <laughs> so, yeah, that's so, wonderful. So, I'm yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Um, if folks have questions, I know some folks do have to run their class and so on, but uh, we have the room for 15 minutes or so. If you yeah, want to I take mean, any questions? 15 so. minutes here, but we're all together for lunch, and afterwards we're available for hours. If you have yeah. more questions, yeah, we'll we, can, we can be together. Yeah. Please. Any questions? So, yes. you mentioned that the, uh, when you have a function that can be computed and compiled. Right? Yes. So, for all of those classes or definitions when you have a default value mm -hmm. and you pop them in there, will it automatically do those wherever it is, and how does that affect compiling? So if you have an expression that you need at compile time, the compiler will look at that expression and see maybe you're adding foo functions result plus bars result. It will see, oh, foo is already compiled. Then it will go compile bar. And bar may use a type, as you mentioned, a struct s in it. Well, it will read the s in it of it. It will go and say, oh, I haven't created the s type info yet, the bit pattern of s. It will build it there, but leave all these marks behind for future use. So your use of certain expressions will help it compile certain things earlier, and then execute the two functions together and add them and give you the result. So it can dynamically figure out, like, go compile this small book. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I have a disclaimer here. Um, compilation is extremely fast. The language is designed to compile fast. However, all the mechanisms you just asked and certain things you can do, because it's so powerful in compile time, you can have a loop that loops too long or does something ridiculous that your compilation can be infinitely long. Because the compiler is executing your code at compile time at that point. So that's the disclaimer. It very, compiles very fast, but it may be inefficient in some compilation cases if you get into very esoteric corner cases. Just a second, I have one here. Yeah, I had a question about the universal function class. Yes. Let's say that I have a member struct with some member function named who, and then I have another pre-function also named who elsewhere. How would that I think member person? takes precedence. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would be the member in that case. All right. Yeah. You very anti-hijack. So if you generally, if you if it doesn't allow you to overtake the, the, the normal API uh, or something. Okay. Or if it does, it'll throw an interview there. Yeah, that's one of the uh, philosophies of was it to begin with. Take this piece of C code and copy paste into D. It should either compile and do the right thing, the same thing, or it should be a compilation error. That starts with that idea too. So you see in that anti-hijacking as well. And is that why like the auto keyword is used a lot in D as well? So auto keyword is a little different. In C++, auto, so auto in the past meant automatic storage duration. You would define your variables way that I can see, you would say auto in something, but then it became, wait a minute, auto happens to be the default after a point, so auto keyword lost its meaning. C++ revived it, meaning automatic type deduction or inference. 
Um, so in C++, you still say uh, auto const, you have to say, if I'm not mistaken there. Even for a const variable, you have to say automatically do it. Indeed, auto means we step back to its original meaning, that means automatic storage duration indeed. And you use it only when there is no other keyword in the syntax when you create a variable. I will go back to that slide, the type in rest. See, for const d immutable s, I didn't say auto. Because const d is a variable declaration, and automatic type inference is in the language already. You don't have to say auto. But for the first one, I didn't want it to be const immutable shared or any other thing. I couldn't put anything else there. But the syntax requires you to use something. That's why we bring auto from the grave, and it's a little difference there, but they're trivia, yeah, basically. Yeah. That was yeah. one. Um, so you said that D has like, uh, it's about 20 times faster in compile time. Yes. Uh, compared to like C, C++. So no, C is huge. Maybe we're, we're slower than C oh, okay. because C doesn't have the, all the features. When you put a language big, C is slow. C is extremely fast. Yeah, so that, that was yeah. kind of my question. Like, what's the secret to make it so fast? Um, okay, first let's talk about C. If you have a single Hello World program where you include IO stream or string, your program is actually not three lines where you print it CR, it's the header file that you included which had macro expansions, which included others and others. It's tens of thousands of lines. Every time your compilation unit includes something, it brings potentially thousands of lines. First of all, that's one of the problem. And two, every character in C++, I'm told, is touched seven times. The compiler needs to parse and do something. Its syntax is so ambiguous. For example, the templates, right? There's a reason why D doesn't use angle brackets for syntax templates. Angle bracket also means less than, right? The compiler must understand what this means, what is less than, all the macros and magics, it's so difficult. So C++ goes back and forth. That's one of the problem, uh, as I'm told. D was created by a compiler writer to make this thing fast. Parse is fast, Lex is fast, but I don't know. As I said, I'm a mere mortal. I'm not coming from that core. Make sense? Yeah? Fine. Good enough. Okay. Lied enough? <laughs> <laughs> there was one. So, uh, two of the features you mentioned um, one is the UFCS and the other is uh, constant functions. CTFE? The Sorry, the, the, so the universal function call. Yes. Okay. And also the fact that you can evaluate any function. Compile time function execution, we so, call it. Yes. Um, my question is if I depend on a module uh, and they have a function that is not explicitly tagged as you know only using features that, avail that are available at mm -hmm. compile time, and then they add some feature that is not available at compile time in that function. Uh, OK. If, is, no, yeah. it's impossible. Okay. You cannot have any type missing at compile time. Yeah. A template doesn't mean things will pop up at runtime. Everything is statically, strongly, statically typed in D. Wow. You may have a typeless function, typeless type, meaning templatized. But the exact point that you're using it at compile time or in another line of code which will be executed at runtime, the types are statically known. Compiler knows exact, knows exact instantiation of that template. So my question is about versioning. So I, I might have a, a version of a module that I depend on call it 2.0, right? Mm -hmm. And they add a 2.1 version. They don't expect it to change compatibility, but they add a new method as part of their struct that has the same name of a function that I was using for UFCS. So now my my dot you know foo now has a different meaning. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Is that is there anything in place to prevent uh, you know, what should be a minor patch becoming a major version change? That, that is not, um, yeah, it would, it would it, it, if you add, um, if you add a member, you can use that member and not the other. Even if, even if, like, let's say your, your function takes, like, a string, mm -hmm. and the, the 
foo member function takes an int. And it's it's not even going to say, oh, I can't call it. Let, let me look elsewhere. It's not calling. It's just going to say, I can't call foo with this string. So, mm -hmm. so you'd have to change your your call. At least it'll be a compiler error, though. You know, like it's going to use that. Uh, oh. Yeah, it would be, or otherwise it would be against the one definition rule. You can't compile one of your pro, some of your program with one version and the other with the other. The struct uh, bit images will be different and they can't work. You will get crashes. It would be against one definition. Well, the member functions aren't part of the thing. They're going to cause crashes because they're so, you know, well, they're not adding data. Yes, but if you change the API, the uh, name mangling will be different and you would have missing uh, linkage symbols. Linker would be failing. Yeah. It, so it depends on where the difference is. The, the linker will, yeah. will not have a problem. Not. Yeah. There, there is a version you can block your code with. So if your API is changing, you could try to protect yourself against yeah. these things. Um, again, that's a little bit of a hack around, but you could say like 2.1 uses this structure. Or something. In general, if, you, if, you depict, if you're adding like, your own methods to things in your own file, you can't protect yourself from the actual provider saying, well, I'm going to actually add those. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they added a, a, a UFCS function in that module, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it would still uh, have an ambiguity. Mm -hmm. so, you have this thing, we have this version uh, feature in the language. You can have symbolic version names, which can be turned on either programmatically in the program at compile time or from the command line. You can build your program for student use or commercial use with this feature. But it's not the same thing. And our standard library doesn't have versioning yet. We're thinking about changing it, uh, the standard library version one now, we want to go to two. And we're looking for ways to use both uh, versions at the same time, allowing it in the same program. We don't have that yet. So I guess my question kind of in the same vein, how does, how does UFCS kind of interact with, uh, you know how we were doing in the XML example where we were like, like overloading, like accessing member functions that, or member fields that didn't exist. Like how does that interact with UFCS? Because if you're, go, if you're doing dot A, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if in the XML example, that, that would usually do with an A equals an XML, but like, say I did a UFCS where like it's A and it takes in an XML, like, is the president's using the like operating overloading? Is it the UFCS? Is it? It will use the operator overload first. Okay. However, you can specify in your op dispatch uh, template use that says it's A and <clears throat> So you can still, you can still <laughs> okay. But, um, but but always always the member function takes precedence. Okay. And I was hesitant in putting that off dispatch a little bit. Right. If you noticed, it actually takes out your uh, type safety. Mm -hmm. I'm accessing missing members. What's right. happening? Maybe it's, I'm gonna mistype something. And then two, I think the yeah. way you implemented it is if you couldn't like reassign a value. It would, it Correct. Like, if you, because I wanted to fit in that slide. Yeah. I you can use an associative array. You can overwrite. You can check whether it's set or not. But I kind of quickly imagined maybe XML works that way too. Maybe you can have the same attribute and the last one takes effect. I don't know. Yeah. I, I have to check it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is. Type safety is out. If yeah. you have a typo, it will still accept and give you a typo attribute. What you can do inside of op dispatch is static assert that attrib uh, or valid ones that can find attrib. One line. So you can have a list of valid ones somewhere. Yeah. 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 These things. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. We have, okay, so I lied with this 59 because you're still here. I can go a little bit further. <laughs> For example, we have this uh, compile time regex uh, in the library. To be honest, this is one of the simple, simple, uh, slowest things if you include the regex because of this guy. 
So the runtime regular expression will parse that domain specific language at runtime and create an engine that knows how to look for that thing. Mm -hmm. But the creation of the engine will be at runtime. Mm -hmm. If you use CT regex and use that template instantiation, the same string, the engine creation will happen at compile time. And you will have this ready engine waiting for you. And this CT regex was the champion, better than V8 engine or whatever for a while. It's the, the engine that's created by the compile time engine actually uses compile time counts. Well, yeah. But then they improve their. This is yeah, not the. Not. This is not the champion at this moment. Okay. How about, while we were on it, let me go back. I have some examples in here. CSV uh, utils. This is a local Silicon Valley person who works at eBay. Mm -hmm. He used D for tools at eBay, and he wrote a family of uh, tools, data mining tools. So for example, you may get two files. Uh, two parts of a comma delimited uh, thing, and you want to join them line by line, find the matching records, etc. Mm -hmm. These tools also appear in uh, Unix command lines. He just wrote it. He just didn't think about performance improvements. He used the garbage collector. He just used it. Mm -hmm. But he found w uh, two spots here. One, don't be an idiot and do an duplication of a key every time you access it. So he fixed it mm -hmm. quickly. And he also improved our, improved our standard library saying, we have this appender, like the vector appender right. thing. But every time I use it, it starts from a fresh memory. Can I say clear? And it reuses the past watermarked, high watermark. Well, oh, we said, yeah, that makes sense. And we improved the standard library. And his tools beat the tools used on the command line everywhere everywhere by everyone. Yeah. He didn't do any performance improvement other than those two things. But what happened? Wait a minute, D passed us. So everybody went back to their tools and improved the performance. <laughs> yeah. Now we are not the fastest. Yeah. <laughs> That's of course natural. Okay. I, there was a question. Um, the iterator that you gave earlier with iterating the file and things about how do the types work? So is there some mix in magic that's happening with that? Uh, that, that time you like opened the file and you did like byline. No, no. I, I, I'll show you. There's it's strongly statically typed SIL. Ah, I think I tested it was here. Yeah, 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 this yeah. One. So file full of text is a type file, right? Byline is a templated range algorithm um, that knows, okay, byline must work on a file actually. Uh, byline is a member of the file struct. Yeah, okay, byline is a member of the file struct. It's not a freestanding function, so I kind of misled you earlier. Byline produces a struct range object. This range object is extremely lightweight. It only has a reference to the file handle, and it's sitting there. All it has is three member functions, as I've shown earlier uh, here. Like this, empty front and pop front. Imagine you writing by line, line by line, sitting on a file handle, and somebody tells you, give me, the, uh, are you empty, somebody says. Oh, looks at the file handle, are you empty? True or false? Somebody says, give me the front element. Mm, let me read a line. Here's the front element. And he, he actually caches that front element cheaply because every string is a fat pointer to the beginning and the length. And then somebody says pop front. Pop front means go to the next line. So it reads another line and puts on top of the line. We have also a bind line copy. That's more expensive, but more safe version. So, so by line is that algorithm, but by line returns a struct that's sitting on a handle. Okay. Um, filter, on the other hand, is not a member function. It's a freestanding function that is templatized on a range type, what by line returns. So that kind uh, type strongly statically comes into filter, and filter now sits on that range, maybe makes a copy of that variable, 
and that variable only lives in filter waiting. And then filter exposes empty front and pop front to its users. So you say, are you empty filter? It goes to its element. Are you empty? Ah, yes, I'm empty. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it does it Yes, uh, compile time duct typing basically, unlike Python's runtime duct yeah. typing. That's that's the key. And filter exposed an input range. Map exposes an input range. It's same. They are just struct having a copy of what is given to them. So at the end, you do get like a nested yeah. type. Big nested, nested big type. type. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. but. Somebody looked at how LLVM uh, uh, LDC compiles this, and magically LDC sees unnecessary empty calls in there and removes those calls. Some magic happens when it gets compiled. And take is extremely simple. It has an N in there, and the original source increments the N every time you take something, pop front, and oh, I'm done. He doesn't ask the range anymore, just the N number count. Okay, any more questions? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. Okay, thank you.